Hello and welcome back to another full Stamp by Step PC build guide and today I'm going to be showing you how to build a PC in the CTE C700R from Thermaltake. Now as the name suggests this is one of their CTE cases and if you haven't heard of CTE it stands for Centralised Thermal Efficiency and it's Thermaltake's idea to really improve the thermals of your major components in the case. They do this by rotating the rutherboard around 90 degrees and in doing that, they're moving the CPU further towards the front of the case, the GPU further towards the back of the case, where each of them has its own independent source of cold air. And then all the hot air is exhausted out the top of the case. So in theory, it sounds like an absolutely brilliant idea, and we'll be doing some thermal testing later on to see how it performs. Okay, let's take a look at the other parts I'm going to be building with today. For the motherboard, I'm going to use Nasrox X670E Tai Chi Carrara. For the CPU, I'm going to be using AMD's Ryzen 7, it's the 7800X 3D. Keeping our CPU cool, I've got a 420mm I.O. from Thermaltake, it's their TH420 V2 Ultra ARGB Sync. For RAM, I've got 32GB of Thermaltake's Tough RAM XG RGB D5 at 6200 megatransfers per second. For storage, I'm going with a single Gen 5 NVMe drive from this build, it's from Adata and it's their Legend 970 in 1TB capacity. Powering the whole build, I've got a 1050 watt fully modular ATX 3.0 power supply from Thermaltake. It's their Tough Power GF A3 Snow. For the graphics card, I'm going to be using ASRock's RX 7700X T Steel Legend. And finally, for case fans, I'm going to be using Thermaltake's CT140 ARGB fans in white. Okay, so that's all the parts. Let's make a start by taking a really detailed look at the case. To remove our tempered glass side panel, there's a tab at the back we simply need to pull out, and then we can tilt the panel out, lift up, and away. Our other side panel is removed in exactly the same way. There's this little tab at the back we simply need to pull out. And then we're going to be able to lift the panel up and away. Taking a look at the back of the panel we've just removed, you'll notice we've got two perforated areas. And the reason these are here is they're to provide airflow to our power supply's intake fan at the bottom. And we're also able to mount a fan behind the motherboard to improve with cooling. These fans have their little clips at the bottom and they're magnetically attached. So you just simply tilt it out to free the magnetic attachment. And then you're going to be able to lift them away for cleaning. Taking a look at our case's top I.O., we've got a power button, we've got two USB Type-A ports, single Type-C port, a separate headphone and microphone jack, and a reset button. So we take a look at our front panel, you can see we've got large perforations in it, which should be good for airflow, and removing the front panel is toolless. We're able to get our hands into here, and then we can simply pull the panel off. With the front panel removed, you can see we've got a full-length dust filter behind it. There's a little clip at the top we can pull out and that's going to free up the dust filter. So you can see Thermaltake have installed a CT140 non-ARGB fan on the front of the case, and you can actually fit three of these 140mm fans on this front fan stroke radiator bracket. If you prefer to go with a radiator at the front, you can actually fit up to a 420mm radiator, but more standard sizes such as 360 or 280 will also fit. On the rear of the case, we've got another large perforated panel, and it's removed exactly the same way as the front panel. You can get your hands in at the top and simply pull out. If we take a look at the back of this panel, you can see the dust filter is actually attached to the panel this time. Really easy to remove. There's a lever here you can simply pull, and that's going to free up the dust filter, and you're going to be able to take it out for cleaning. So at the back, in terms of fan and radiator mounted, it's exactly the same story at the front, up to four 140mm fans, and you can see Thermaltake have installed another CT140 fan, are up to a 420mm radiator. And again, we've got a removal fan stroke radiator bracket. You'll notice the orientation of this fan is actually pointing in towards the case, and this is part of the CTE theme the thermal taker are going for. You're actually going to have the back of the case's intake instead of exhaust compared to what you would have in a standard case. And the idea behind this is these fans are going to be bringing cooler in for your graphics card, which is actually going to be hanging in the upright position, which I'll show you later on. So to remove the fan stroke radiator brackets on the front and the back, there's four screws that we're going to need to remove. So I've also freed up our fan cables from the back and then we should simply be able to lift the bracket out. So our top panel is removed in a very similar way to the other panels. There's a notch here you can get your finger into and then it's just a matter of pulling the panel up. And again, if we take a look at the back of this panel, you'll notice we've got a dust filter built into it. Little tab here to remove it exactly the same way as the rear panel. Taking a look in from the top of the case, our third and final pre-installed 140mm case fan is here and it is set to exhaust. 
Now Thermal Take have hooked me up with obviously loads of ARGB fans and the version of the fans that come with this case don't have ARGB on them. So I'm going to be removing this fan and replacing it with the ones that have ARGB on it. So this fan is held in with long radiator screws from the top. So we just need to remove the four screws and then we'll just free up the fan cables and then we should be able to lift the fan straight off. We are able to mount another either 120 or 140 millimeter fan on this removable fan bracket. To remove it, there's two thumb screws we're going to need to remove. And then with the thumb screws removed, we can simply tilt the bracket up and lift it out to free it up. So with that bracket removed, if we take a look in from the top, you can see our PCI expansion slot brackets are below it. And that's because our graphics card is going to be hanging from the top of the case in the upright position. And I'll show you more on how to mount it later on. So moving back into the main body of the case, you can see we've got a large case accessory box, which I'm going to remove. If you are thinking of going with a custom loop, you'll be pleased to see we've got a pump reservoir bracket on the bottom of the case. It's held on with two thumb screws at the front. In terms of fan and radiator mounting down at the bottom of the case, it's up to two 140 or three 120 millimeter fans, or up to a 360 or 280 millimeter radiator. Again, at the bottom, we've got a removable fan stroke radiator bracket. It's held on with these two thumb screws. And then with the thumb screws removed, we can simply tilt the bracket up and lift away. And we've got a full length dust filter at the bottom, which can simply be pulled out from the side. So in terms of motherboard support, the case supports motherboards up to AATX in size. And you take a look at the pattern of the standoffs. This is because our motherboard is going to be rotated around 90 degrees from the standard orientation. I've gone ahead and set a motherboard into the case to give you an idea of what this looks like. This is an EATX motherboard in terms of size. And we've got our IO up at the top here. Now the idea behind this is to bring the CPU closer to its own source of fresh air at the front of the case. And you can see our graphics card, which is going to be hanging here in the upright position from the top of the case with the fans facing towards the back and you're going to have intake fans at the back, means that they're going to have their own source of air from the back of the case. So we're also going to be having intake from the bottom of the case. That's going to be bringing the airflow from the bottom up and out the top. And I've already shown you we can mount two exhaust fans on the top of the case. We do have one further fan mounting location in the case's second compartment, and it's going to go on this removable bracket where you can either mount a 120 or 140 millimeter fan. You can see we've got our motherboard here, and the idea is if you set a fan on set to exhaust, and this is a 140 millimeter fan in terms of size, it's going to help draw any hot air away from the back of the motherboard, helping keep it cool. So one of the things you might be wondering with your motherboard's I.O. coming out at the top, and also your graphics card I.O. coming out the top, how are you going to plug the cables in? You can see here you've got absolutely loads of room at the top for your cables for both your graphics card and your motherboard. And then you're going to see we've got little cutouts here above the graphics card and the motherboard to pass the cables through to the second compartment. They're then going to come through these cutouts here where you're going to route them towards the back of the case. And then we've got this rubber grommet just above where our power supply is going to go and then all the cables are going to exit out through here. I suppose the only thing you're going to have to factor in with this is you might need slightly longer cables if you've already pre-managed all your cables at your desk. Instead of plugging them in here, they're going to have to route quite a bit further inside the case. So that's the only thing to factor in. While there's absolutely loads of radiator mounting locations in this case, if you do want to go with an air cooler, you're going to not have any problems mounting a large premium air cooler with a maximum height supported of up to 190 millimeters. So you can see at the top of the case, we've got seven PCI expansion slot brackets. And to mount your card, you just need to remove the brackets exactly the same way you would in a standard case. So it's these two I need to remove. So you can see you can fit pretty large graphics cards in the case. Without a radiator at the bottom, it's up to 410 millimeters for your graphics card in terms of length. If you do insert a radiator at the bottom, it's up to 327 millimeters. And you can see the whole reason Thermaltake are doing this. The fans from your graphics card are now going to be facing this fan stroke radiator bracket that you're going to have at the back of the case. And the fans blowing cooler are going to go directly into your GPU fans. So you can see in this position, the graphics card is actually pretty secure, but Thermaltake do offer a couple of mounting options at the bottom to help support it. So this is our first support bracket, and it's this top row that we're going to want to secure it in. So if we take a look at the back, we've got some screw holes in it. So it's just a matter of lining it up with the right holes for your graphics card. So I think for ours, here's where we're going to want to put it. And then we can simply screw it in from the back, and the screws you're going to use come in the bag with a support bracket. So we take a closer look at it, you've got this nice little rubber pad which is going to sit up against the back of your graphics card. And to adjust the height of it, it's just a simple matter of rotating it round. And as you rotate it, it brings this closer to your graphics card where it's going to provide support.
So you're gonna leave it all the way towards the back, install your graphics card, and then screw it this way anti-clockwise till it supports your GPU. So the other support bracket that we have is this one here. Um, it's these two brackets and they're held together with a little thumb screw at the back. Um, we've got rubber pads here and here and the idea is they're gonna hold your graphics card in place so it can't move from side to side. Um, now how it's gonna work is there's another row of perforations just above this top set of rubber grommets. So I think this bracket is only designed to be used with standard ATX motherboards. We've got an ATX motherboard which is hiding the perforations. So I'm just gonna go ahead and remove the motherboard. So all we would simply do is set this bracket into place. On the end of this bracket, there's a little hole. So we're just gonna line it up with the hole in the back. And then we're gonna pop a thumb screw in at the back. So this is what it looks like in the front. So after installing your graphics card, you can simply push the bracket this way till it's providing support for your graphics card and then fully tighten the thumb screw up at the top. Now, because I've been using the knee ATX motherboard, I'm hanging my graphics card from the third and fourth slot from the top. Um, normally it would be the second and third for most graphics cards. So I'm just gonna need to move this bracket where I've screwed it through the thumb screw one hole further towards the back of the case. The first thing I'm gonna do is just adjust this support bracket till it's just touching the graphics card. So we're gonna turn it anti-clockwise. So there we go. Now the graphics card's resting nicely up against this bracket. And then I'm gonna slide the bracket towards the back of the case towards supporting the graphics card. So I think just about there seems to be right. And then at the other end, we can just squeeze the bracket up this way onto the graphics card. So there we go, that's our graphics card nicely wedged between the brackets. Just check the fans, it's not obstructing the spinning. And then at this stage, we can finally tighten the thumb screw at the back. So even though we don't have a graphics card plugged into the motherboard, it's lovely and secure, held between the bracket at the top and the bracket at the side and the one at the rear, just keeping it in the right place. So this is a perfect solution. If you've got an ATX motherboard, you're gonna be able to install it just the way I've shown you and be able to get both those brackets on. Um, certainly if you're going with an ATX motherboard like I am, you're not gonna have access to these top row of mounting holes. What you could of course do, if you're going with a long graphics card like I have, you could of course move this bracket down to the bottom set of holes. And again, if you're going with a big wide graphics card like I have, it does look like it's gonna be possible to have both these brackets in place. So you can have the larger bracket on both sides and then put the one from behind on top of it. Um, if you're going with a narrower card, there might not be enough room to get both of them in. So our graphics card in this position is definitely gonna have the best airflow with a source of airflow coming straight in from the back of the case into the intake fans of the graphics card. Although this side of the graphics card never looks as good. That's the reason why a lot of people prefer to mount the graphics card vertically in the case. Thermaltake have thought of this and there is a way that you can actually rotate the graphics card round so the fans are gonna be on display with the tempered glass panel. So to allow us to do that, it's held on with four screws. There's two at the back and two at the top. So with the screws removed, our bracket is now free and we're gonna be able to remove it from the case. So we're not gonna be using this bracket to mount our graphics card in the rotated position. It's actually this one that comes in the case accessory box that we're gonna be using. So we take a look at our bracket, you'll notice this side is slightly smaller than this side. So it's the smaller side that we're gonna to want to go onto and we're gonna set this bracket up into place. So we turn our bracket around, you'll notice there's four holes on the side and we've got this separate bracket here that we're just gonna fix into place, line them up with the four holes. So this is how our bracket's gonna be orientated in the case. The graphics card's gonna win from the side, screwed in from here, and then it's gonna to attach to a riser cable. Now you've got two sets of standoffs, there's one here and if we rotate it round, there's another set of standoffs here. And the standoffs that you attach your riser cable on tends, depends on what the connector on the end of your riser cable is. If you've got a right angle connector, you're gonna connect it onto here. If you've got a straight connector, you're gonna connect it onto the standoffs. So the riser cable I'm gonna be showing with you, you can see here, it's a right angle connector. The cable goes this way, but the connector's here. So we're gonna to want to attach it onto the one at the side. And again, the screws we use are exactly the same ones throughout the whole process. So obviously it would make sense if you're picking these parts up for a new to go with a white riser cable. We can then insert the bracket in from the top of the case. And you'll notice I've loosened these screws slightly and the reason for that is you are gonna have some travel room on where you center this bracket. So you can center it more towards the back or the front of the case depending on where you prefer. And then we're gonna secure it into place with the four screws we removed earlier on. So those two screws in, you can just decide where you want it in the case and then the other four screws will hold it in place. So I'm just gonna have it centered in the middle. 
Then all we need to do is line the graphics card up with the riser cable and secure it into place with another two of the same screws. So obviously all you need to do then is plug the other end of the riser cable into the PCIe slot on your motherboard. And if you are planning to install your graphics card in this orientation, you should probably plug this cable into the motherboard first before installing the graphics card because it is going to block the slots on the motherboard. So if you're going for aesthetics in your build, this is definitely the way you're going to want to mount your graphics card. You're going to have the good side of the graphics card with the fans facing the tempered glass panel. Um, there is going to be some downsides to doing this. The first is cost. Um, the riser cable that you're going to need doesn't come with a case, so you are going to have to pick that up at additional cost. In terms of Thermaltake's CTE, probably the best way to have your graphics card mounted is facing the fans directly at the back, although still some air is going to be coming in and going past the fans and then out the top. But I would imagine having the graphics card in this orientation isn't going to be as good as facing the fans. And again, that's probably something I'll test later on. Final thing is stability. The graphics card is floating in the middle of the case. It's reasonably stable here, but it's not quite as good as what we were getting plugging it directly into the motherboard. Moving into our case's second compartment, we've got absolutely loads of space in terms of cable management. And in the case accessory box, we get loads of cable ties and Velcro cable straps. And we've got absolutely loads of cable tie down points spread throughout the case. Because of our motherboard orientation, cables are going to be coming out towards the bottom and front of the case. And good to see that we've got rubber grommets over the cutouts going through to here. As we already mentioned, we've got this bracket behind the motherboard where you can mount up to a 140mm fan. The other option you have for this is to mount a 3.5 inch drive. It's simply going to set into the place here and then you're going to screw it in from the other side. So this bracket is removable. There's one screw at the bottom we need to remove. And then we can tilt the bracket out and lift away. In terms of mounting drives in the case, Thermaltake have really got you covered with these two drive trays. They're each held on with two screws at the side. And then you're going to be able to push the case towards the middle and lift out. So we take a look at the bracket that we've removed. It's actually two brackets joined together. The three and a half inch drive bracket is the bit at the bottom. And then we've got the two and a half inch drive bracket sitting on top held on with two screws. So we'll go ahead and remove the two and a half inch drive bracket. So if you don't want to install any two and a half inch drives, you can actually install three three and a half inch drives on each of these brackets. So one would go on top, and then you're just going to simply screw it in from the bottom using the three and a half inch drive screws that come in the case accessory box. Then you're going to be able to insert another two three and a half inch drives into the hard drive tray. And again, using the same screws, you're going to be able to screw the drive in from the side to secure it in place. So we've got two of these drive trays, each able to take three three and a half inch drives, and we can install one in the bracket behind the motherboard, giving us a total drive capacity of seven three and a half inch drives in this case. Your two and a half inch drives are installed in a very similar way. You're going to simply set your first drive on top of the bracket and screw it in from the holes in the back using the two and a half inch drive screws, which are the same ones we're going to be using to secure the motherboard to the case. You're then going to be able to start a further two two and a half inch drives into the bracket itself. And then you're just going to want to get the drives lined up with the holes in the side and again screw it in with the same two screws. So on each of the drive trays, you could have up to two three and a half inch drives in the drive trays themselves and three two and a half inch drives on top. So it gives you a total of five three and a half inch drives and six two and a half inch drives mounting in the case. Your power supply is going to go down at the bottom and the case is compatible with full sized ATX power supplies up to a maximum length of 220 millimeters. In terms of installing your power supply, you've got this nice adjustable bracket at the bottom. For the power supply I'm going to be using it, it is in the right place. So all I need to do is slide my power supply into place and lower it down. And the bracket's going to support it really nicely, holding it in place. If you do have a longer power supply, you're going to have to adjust this bracket. So we just need to loosen the thumb screw. That's then going to allow us to tilt the bracket back and lift it out. So the slot that you're going to put it back into is labeled depending on the length of your power supply. So it ranges from 140 to 220. So say you did have a 220 millimeter power supply, you would slot it in to the holes marked 220 and then flatten it down. And you can see then the thumb screw is going to go at the end. And you've got these little rubber pads here, which are going to support your power supply. 
We are now ready to start working on the motherboard and we are going to be installing our CPU, our M.2 SSD and our RAM before we put the motherboard into the case. To open the socket for our CPU we need to push this lever down and out and bring it all the way towards the middle of the motherboard and then we are going to be able to open the socket cover up. We can then take our CPU and set it down into the socket making sure the text is the correct way up and once we are happy it's sitting correctly in the socket we can close the socket cover down again and then if we close the lever it's going to secure our CPU in place and we will put the black bit of plastic in the motherboard box for safekeeping. Because we've got a Gen 5 drive, we're going to need to install it in the top slot in the motherboard. The heatsink is held on with two screws. We can then insert our drive into the slot at a slight angle. And once it's in place, we'll go ahead and flatten it down. And then we'll secure it to the motherboard using one of the screws that came in the motherboard box. If you're using the motherboard from new, there'll be some plastic protection on the back of the heatsink that you're going to need to remove. We're going to be installing our RAM in the second and fourth slot along from the CPU so we can go ahead and open the clips on these slots. And then we can line the RAM up with the slot. Once we're happy everything's lined up it's just some firm pressure to the RAM and it's going to clip into place. Same thing with our second stick. We can then set the motherboard into the case, line that up with the standoffs at the back and then we're going to secure it into place with nine of the screws with a little lip around the outside. Next thing to do is get our case cables plugged in. Our HD audio cable is going to go into this header here. So we can route the cable through the cutout, line it up with the header and push into place. Then we've got our front panel connectors into this header here down at the bottom left hand corner. So we're going to bring the cables through the cutout at the bottom. And starting in the top row working from left to right, first of all we've got power LED positive and power LED negative. Next to that we've got our power switch. Then moving down to the bottom row, again working from left to right, the first two pins are for hard drive LED positive and hard drive LED negative. And next to that we've got our reset switch. And then we'll just pull all the excess cable through to the back. Our USB 3.0 cable is going to go into this header here, so we'll go ahead and bring the cable through the cutout, line it up with the header and push into place. And pull the excess cable through to the back. And next to that we've got a front panel type C header, so we'll bring our cable through the cutout, line it up with the header push into place and again pull the excess cable through to the back. So we're now ready to install our power supply. It is fully modular come without any of the cables plugged in. I've gone ahead and plugged in the cables that we're going to need. So I plugged in a 24 pin power connector, two 8 pin EPS cables to write additional power to our CPU and I've also plugged in a PCIe cable to power our graphics card. One other thing to point out is our power supply does have a smart zero fan mode. So whenever the power supply is under low loads, the fan will stop spinning, helping reduce noise in the build. And Thermaltake have put a nice little sticker here, because it always is confusing. Should I have this turned to on or off to enable the fan? So they've labelled it here on. The fan does not operate when the power supply is under low load. So that's what we want. So we're going to turn it to on, and then we can remove the sticker. We can then set our power supply into place at the bottom of the case. So remember to set the bracket to the right size of your power supply before setting it in. And then we can secure the power supply into place before the larger screws from the case accessory box. Our two 8-pin EPS cables are going to go into these headers, so we can go ahead and bring them through the cutout, line them up with the headers, and push into place. And then we'll just pull all the excess cable through to the back. Our 24-pin cable is going to go into this header here, so we'll bring it through the rubber grommet, line it up with the header, and push into place and then we'll just pull the excess cable through to the back. So just before we start working on the I.O. we're going to want to remove the fan from the front bracket. So next we can set our front bracket onto our radiator and then we can set the fans on top of the bracket. Now importantly these cables you are going to want to have coming out towards the second compartment of the case. And then we can pass the long radiator screws through the fans, through the bracket and into the radiator. And I'm just going to put the screws in loosely until we've got them all screwed into place. And that's why you put them in loosely. You see there the holes weren't lining up and I was able to give it a little push to get them to line up. And now that's all the screws caught into place we can go ahead and tighten them up. So coming from each of our fans we've got two different connectors. We've got a four pin PWM connector and they are daisy chainable with an additional connector here. And we've got a three pin five volt ARGB connector and also a daisy chainable connector here. So you just need to decide which end you want all the cables coming out the top or the bottom. I'm going to have them all coming out the bottom. So all I simply need to do is connect the cables from this top fan 
to the next middle fan. So we start off with the PWM connectors. I'm going to take the PWM connector from here and plug it in to the daisy chainable connector here. And then I'm going to take our PWM connector from here and plug it in to here. Then coming with our I.O. we get this long cable. There's a PWM header here and on the other end we've got a cable which we're going to plug into our CPU fan header. And if we did want to daisy chain something else into it, there's an additional connector here. So it's just a matter of plugging this end into here. We've got the long cable and then we've got this connector to go into our CPU fan header. And then I'm just going to remove all these black stickers. We need to then do something similar with our ARGB cables. So we can pull the rubber protector off here and join in the two cables together. Now these cables do have a tendency to come apart at the back of the case. So Thermaltake has thought about this and they include these little plastic covers which go over the top. So it's just a matter of lining the plastic cover up and pushing into place and that's going to prevent these cables coming loose. So then we can remove the protector from the next cable, line it up together and push into place and then we'll put the connector on to keep them joined up. So this leaves us with one ARGB connector on the other end and again we've got a nice long cable that comes with the I.O. to go into it. And then again we'll put the clip on to hold the cables in place. At the end of this we've got a 3 pin 5 volt ARGB connector to go into an ARGB header on our motherboard and if you did want to daisy chain something else in you've got another connector here. Then if we move over and take a look at our pump we've got one cable coming from it. It's a 4 pin PWM connector and that's going to go into the pump header on the motherboard. If you take a closer look at the pump you'll notice we have additional connector on it and that's for our USB cable. It's simply going to slot into place here and on the other end we're going to plug this cable into a USB 2.0 header on our motherboard. Last thing for us to do is to assemble the bracket that's going to allow us to attach the pump onto the motherboard. So if you've got an AMD CPU this is the bracket you're going to use. You're going to take these little clips and pass them up through here and then take one of the thumb screws and put them on very loosely. You really only want to just get them to clip on because if you put them on any tighter you're going to struggle to get this onto the bracket on your motherboard. Then all we need to do is slot the bracket into place. There's little grooves on the CPU and it's just simply going to push and clip into place. If you're installing it on an Intel motherboard you're going to put this bracket into place instead. You're going to select the right back plate for the socket that you're using attached to the back of your motherboard. There's then some standoffs that go into each of these four corners and then the bracket's going to go over the top and you're going to secure it on with some thumb screws. So I think it's going to be easier to install it without the USB cable plugged in so we'll plug it in later on. We can then set our I.O. into place at the front of the case and we'll secure it into place with the four screws we removed at the start. And then I'm just going to pass all the fan cables through to the back of the case. So I don't think you're going to be able to see these cables from the main body of the case once we put the dust filter back in place but I am just going to manage them down anyway. I'm going to use a couple of the cable ties just to keep them better organised. And at this stage we can then clip our front dust filter back into place and replace our front panel. This is our CPU fan header, so I'm just going to bring the PWM cable coming from the fans through, line it up with the header and push into place and then pull the excess cable through to the back. And we've got two RGB headers down here, so I'm going to bring the RGB cables coming from the fans through, line them up with the header and push into place. Next we can add some thermal paste to the centre of the CPU and thermal take to include it with the cooler. Then we want to line the clips and the pump up with the bracket on the motherboard. So we're just going to get the bottom one on. And then we'll slide the top one into place and that's it clipped into place as well. So did you spot the mistake? I forgot to remove the plastic protection from the cold plate and this caused the CPU to overheat whenever I powered the system on. So make sure you remove the plastic protection from the cold plate. And then all I'm going to do is tighten the screw on each side in turn. Our pump header is just this one here so we can plug the cable coming from the pump into it. And then all we're going to do is route the excess cable through to the back of the case. We can then plug our USB cable into the pump and then we're just going to route the cable up towards the top of the motherboard and pass it through the rubber grommet at the back. And we'll line it up with one of the headers and push into place. And then we'll just pull the excess cable through to the back. And we just need to remember to remove the plastic protection from the pump. I've attached another three ARGB fans to our rear fan bracket just exactly the same way as we did on the other radiator bracket. So I'm just going to pass all the cables into the main body of the case and then we'll line the bracket up and secure it into place with the four screws we removed at the start. 
And then you're just going to pull all the fan cables through to the back. And then we can replace our rear panel. Then we've got our bottom fan bracket to set into place. And we can secure it into place with the two thumb screws. And then we can route the fan cables through to the back. Next we can get some of our fan cables plugged in. So we've got an ARGB header here. So I'm going to bring one of the ARGB cables from the back through, line it up with a header and push into place. And then we'll just pull the excess cable again through to the back. And then two headers above, we've got a PWM fan header. So I'm just going to bring the cable again coming from our rear fans and get it plugged in to that header. We've got another system fan header here. So we'll bring the cable from the bottom fans through and plug it into here. And then we've got another ARGB cable down at the bottom and we'll get it plugged in to here. We've got another two system fan headers here. So I'm just going to bring some cables through for our top and rear fans. The reason I'm plugging them in at this stage is because once we put our graphics card into place, it's going to be much harder to get the fan cables plugged in. And I think we should probably be installing our graphics card next. We're now ready to install the graphics card. So it's the third and fourth slot cover from the front that I need to remove. For most ATX motherboards, it's going to be the second and third. We can then open the clip on the top slot. And then all we're going to do is line our graphics card up with the motherboard. Once we're happy everything's lined up, it's just some firm pressure to the graphics card and it is going to clip into place. And then we can secure it into place again at the top with the two screws. We can then bring our PCIe cable through the cutout and get it plugged into the graphics card. I'm going to go ahead and plug my HDMI cable in at this stage because once we put the top fan in, it is going to block access to the ports. Although it does swivel out and it's only a couple of screws at the front you're going to need to remove. So we can pass the cable through the cutout. We'll get it plugged into the graphics card. And then I'm just going to bring the other end of the cable out through the rubber grommet at the back. On the top of the case, we can set on another 140mm ARGB fan. And we'll secure it into place with the long radiator screws. I fixed another fan to the removable bracket at the top and I'm just going to slot it into place. And then we'll secure it with the thumb screws. So again, I'm just going to daisy chain the fans together. I'm going to bring one of the long PWM cables that we have plugged in already to the motherboard up to the top of the case and plug the other end of the connector into it. I'm also going to link up our ARGB cables and pop the little connector on to keep them together. I'm then going to bring another ARGB cable up to the top of the case and plug it into the two fans. And then we'll put the connector on to keep the two cables together. And at this stage we can replace our case's top panel. We've got a spare ARGB header coming from our bottom fan, so I'm going to remove the rubber protector from that and plug our top fans into it. Last we've got our rear fan which I've installed on the bracket in exhaust and we're going to install that in behind the motherboard. And then we'll secure it at the bottom with a screw. So because this fan is going to be in our rear compartment and we're not going to see it, and I actually don't want lots of ARGB lighting shining out this side of the case, I've installed one of our non-ARGB fans that were originally installed in the main body of the case. So we've got our fan cable here. I'm just going to plug it into the long PWM connector that we had already plugged into our motherboard. And that's everything connected up. Okay, last thing to do is some cable management.
So that's the build complete and looking absolutely amazing. The parts I've chosen just go so well together and they all really complement each other. In terms of setting the PC up, I've done that off camera as you can see. The reason I've done that is I've made another build guide with this motherboard, another AMD CPU, and the steps for setting everything up will be exactly the same. The only thing that might be slightly different is setting up this particular AIO and I will cover that towards the end of this video. But what I want to do now is take a look at the temperatures. So when I first set the PC up, it was running incredibly loud at idle. The fans were running quite at a high speed, making a lot of noise, and that's because our CPU was idling really high. Somewhere between around about 55 and 65, which is much hotter than the CPU should be idling. I checked all the settings, I couldn't find any reason for it, and was then planning to reapply the CPU killer check the thermal paste, and when I took it off, I discovered the problem. I'd actually left the plastic on the back of the cold plate, and that was the reason the CPU was overheating. So just a little lesson, always remember to remove this. I build about a PC every two weeks on average, and this is the first time I've done it, but I'm sure it won't be the first time a lot of you watching will have done it. So just a reminder to be careful with that. And another thing to stress is actually the importance of thermal testing a PC after you've bought it. I was alerted to a problem by the fact the fans were running much louder than I was expecting them to, which then prompted me to run some benchmarks. And I was just simply turning Nida 64 on, I was able to see that CPU is running much hotter than what it should be. So something you should probably do after you've built your PC. So after I got that fixed, our Ryzen 7 5800X 3D idled at 40 degrees and reached a maximum of 79 degrees during a 10 minute Nida 64 stability test. Our 7700XT idled at 26 degrees and reached a maximum of 70 degrees during the IDA64 stability test. With 11 fans in the build all running on the standard motherboard fan curves, it was quite loud at idle at 41 decibels and we had an average noise level of 54 decibels under load. So because the temperatures were so good, I did go into the bias settings and change all the fan curves to the silent fan curves and that solved the noise problem at idle. It came down by 8 to an average of 33 decibels, which is lovely and quiet, particularly for a PC with 11 case fans in it. So you might be wondering about our Gen 5 drives temperatures. Um, you'll notice in this build I actually removed it from the actively cooled heatsink and just used the standard motherboard heatsink. The reason for that is the actively cooled heatsink has an incredibly noisy fan. It's sat apart, there's no speed controls for it and it was absolutely unbearable to use in the last build that I installed it in. So that was the reason if I was going to be using this drive again, I was going to be using it outside the stock heatsink. So during a crystal disk mark benchmark, the maximum that our drive reached was 73 degrees, which compared fairly well to the last time I used the drive, where we had 72 degrees with the active cool fan turned off and in the standard heatsink, and 62 degrees when we had the fan turned on. So what I'm planning to do now is some thermal testing. The bits I'm particularly interested in are removing the rear fan behind the motherboard to see does that make any difference to the temperatures, changing the orientation of our graphics card so the fans are actually facing the front of the case, seeing how that affects our temperatures. So that's going to be all included in the case review. You probably aren't going to want to check that video out if you're thinking of doing a build in this case and I'll put a link to that video in the description. If you have enjoyed this video, please remember to give it a thumbs up. And if you're not currently subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button as well. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave you with a guide to setting up the software on this particular AIO. And I'll see you in the next video. So what I want to do now is show you how to customize the screen on our AIO. So we're going to head over to Thermaltakes page. You'll find a link in the video description. And we're going to click on download. We can then head over to our downloads folder. We'll right click on the file. Click on Extract All and Extract. And then we can go on ahead and install the RNGP software. Click Yes. Next, we'll just click We Agree and Install. And then we can go ahead and click Finish and run the program. Okay, so whenever we load the software up, it's going to tell us we don't have a controller installed. That's fine. We can still use the software with what we have installed. If we click on My PC, it's going to give us loads of information about our PC. So we can see our CPU, the temperature, the load, the fan speed, the wattage and the frequency. Um, we've got our two GPUs installed, the dedicated GPU and our integrated graphics. And over here we've got our tough RAM and lots of information about it and its current loaded temperatures are going to be displayed.
Um, if we head over to lighting, this is where we're going to be able to adjust the effects in our RAM. It's currently set to white, um, which is just the way I want it. But you can pick different effects from here and go ahead and pick whatever color that you want. What I'm more interested in showing you today is our LCD screen. So we go ahead and click on it. The first thing you're going to notice, you take a look over at the PC, is it isn't currently centered. Um, it looks centered in the software, but because we installed our pump in a different orientation, we're going to have to rotate the screen. So I'm going to click here, which is this way around. And if we rotate the display around this way, it's now going to be showing the correct way on our AIO. So what you can see, it's currently displaying our liquid temperature. Um, so we've got a whole lot of things we can customize. The first is that we want to customize the colors of the individual things. We can do that. So at the moment, we're on liquid temperature. Um, visual color number two um, is the blue on the outside. So we click on it and say we want to make that a green. We can do that, click apply. Or for this particular bill, because it's mostly white, white might actually look better. And click on apply. So any of those visuals, it's no problem for us to change them. If we want to make the temperature into an orange, we can do that as well. And it's going to change over to orange. So you can pick the colors that you want. You can also control the information that comes up on the display. So we've got liquid temperature at the moment. Say we wanted to display our CPU temperature, we can do that. Click on Apply. And again, the visuals are carried on throughout. So we're going to put that back to the default color. We can do that as well. Um, showing you what's available, we've got frequency, load, temperature. We've got our GPU frequency and load. We've got our RAM size, frequency, RAM temperature, RAM load, liquid temperature, which you've seen. Or what we can actually do is select carousel. We can pick the effects that we want to come up. So let's select them all. And we can go ahead and click on apply. So what it's now going to do is it's going to cycle through the various effects, displaying each of them on the screen for a fixed amount of time. If we want to change the speed that they display through, we can drag the slider down to slow it down or push it up to speed it up. And we don't want some of these display, we can obviously turn them off or on and again customize all the colors of the visuals. So, for example, the background, if we want to make that a different color, let's make it into, uh, say, like pink. Click apply. We can do that and that's going to change it over. So, I'll just put that back to the default. Taking a look at the other options that we have, so we've got the weather as an option. Um, so, we can Pick and choose what it displays. We've got our date and city. Apply. So the only side issue with this is it thinks I'm in Middlesbrough, um, whereas I'm actually in Northern Ireland. But it's going to show the weather. It's going to give you an idea of what it looks like. And again, we can pick and choose what comes up on the screen. So we've got the temperature in a bit of a grey here. If we want to make it easier to see, for example, put it to red, we can get it to show up like that. And it's going to be a little bit clearer. Take a look at the other options. We also got the clock. If we want to display the clock, we just pick the style that we want. Click on Apply. And we're going to have the clock going round. We can choose a different style if we want. Let's try Style 3. And that's what it looks like. So probably one of the more interesting options is actually to get some of the photos or videos coming up on the screen. And to do that, we click on Upload File. So you can see here we've got some preloaded. So let's try one of these and click on OK and apply and you'll see it's now displayed on our NIO. Um, I'll show you what another one of these looks like. Click on OK and apply. OK and apply. And OK and apply. So while we have this on, it is also possible to add text under the screen as well. So we just need to select what we want to display. We'll select the first lot of these and click on Apply. And what you'll notice then, down at the bottom, our data is going to be displayed. Um, can't really see it very well because the background is quite dark. But what we can actually do, we want to make the text brighter. We just want to drag this all the way up to the top and click on Apply. And that's going to make it stand out a little bit better. And again, we have the option to adjust the speed that the text is being displayed. So let's turn this off for the moment. But it is possible to upload your own files. So all we need to do is click on Upload, click on Open. 
And I've saved some of these in the picture. So I can click on my logo, click on open and OK and apply. And you'll now see that my logo is being displayed on the I.O. It is possible to upload videos. So if I can upload, click on open and we can select my logo video file. Now we are able to adjust this here. Um, you'll notice as it's playing, it's not quite centered. So I can drag this over to the middle. Um, it is going to cut off slightly. I can zoom in and out. Uh, that's going to display everything, but it is going to cut the bars at the top and the bottom. But what I could do is shift that up slightly, having the video display in the top of the screen, and we put a little bit of text on at the bottom in that black bar. So let's try that. Apply. Um, and then what we can do is say pick CPU temperature frequency. We'll just pick them all. And click on apply. So we've got this video playing, but we've also got some information being displayed at the bottom.